speaking, tantras that classified themselves as highest yoga tantras. Or unexcelled yoga tantras, or unsurpassed yoga tantras, anuttara yoga tantras. For those of you who are not Sanskrit, Sanskritists would like to say the word. It's un utra. Ooh, my. I spend my day doing this. Un utra, un utra, not un utara. Okay? Un utara. Now, these tantras that proclaim themselves as un utra yoga tantras. Some of them, at least, spoke, or their commentators, spoke about there being four classes of tantra, which, you know, of course, the other classes weren't highest. <laughs> so. You have Anuttara Yoga Tantra, and then of course you have Yoga Tantra, and Performance, Charya, and Kriya. Interesting. <coughs> Kriya. Now, and they laid out the differences between these four classes of tantras in at least nine different ways. And that is in chapter 13. I find all of the ways to be unsuitable to not work. Tsongaba finds one of them to work. He finds one of them. Pudun cataloged all of the ways, and himself puts down, I forget how many of them. Tsongaba finds only one of them, as I remember, only one, maybe two. But I think it's only one to be acceptable. Um, and when Buddhism, if you look at Buddhism, uh, Tantric Buddhism in Japan, they do an amalgamation of action, performance, and yoga without distinguishing which is which. From a Tibetan, maybe I could say untutored Tibetanist point of view, it looks as if they missed out on the highest and they couldn't make a difference among these three. Well, actually, I think if you look back, uh, this division into four is artificial in the first place, plus the nine ways in which the four are distinguished don't seem, that, don't seem to stand up that well anyway. So this rigid identification that one learns early on in Tibetan studies uh, gives you a skewed view when you look at Japanese tantric Buddhism. Now, there are differences. There are things present in Tibet that aren't in Japan, and there must be vice versa also. Now,
the path of meditation that we're talking about here is that of action tantra. And <clears throat> the particular tantra is the concentration continuation tantra. The Indian commentary that Songhova is following is that by Buddha Guya. And into his explanation, he also mixes in, and it's very interesting to see his weaving when you look up all of the sources uh, in, the, in these two Indian texts, how he weaves from paragraph to paragraph, sometimes sentence to sentence, the, his two sources. Now, Varabodhi is come, is, uh, uh, did a uh, practice text on the Susiddhi Tantra. Wow. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, Tsongkhapa says that the difference between Sutra and Tantra is that Tantra involves deity yoga and Sutra doesn't. De deity yoga, you could say, is of, in general maybe, of two types. Meditating on a deity in front of yourself and meditating on yourself as a deity. When he says the deity yoga is the difference between Sutra and Tantra, it's meditation on yourself as a deity that is the difference. Because, for instance, there are, one invites Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in the sutra systems in front of you, or imagine them in front of you, in space, whatever, and you make offerings to them and so forth, and that does not constitute Tantra. His claim is that is in sutra, there is no instance even, uh, in which one meditates on oneself as having the body of a Buddha. Now that means as having a similitude of a body of a Buddha. You don't, even though you're thinking, you know, this is an actual Buddha body, it's a pretended, it's an intentional meditation. You're not engaged in wrongly identifying your body as a Buddha body. So there in these tantric systems, there is meditation that accords in aspect with a Buddha's form body. Now, if we speak of a Buddha as having body and mind, is there meditation in sutra that accords in aspect with a Buddha's mind? You're nodding yes. I think so. Yes. What is it? A meditation on emptiness. Yes. Yes. It's meditation on emptiness. Now, really, a Buddha's mind has two aspects, as we saw last time. The, the omniscient mind, the one that uh, non-dualistically knows the emptiness of all phenomena and all universes simultaneously, and the other that knows the varieties of phenomena. Well, actually, when you say that there is meditation in the sutra system that accords an aspect with the Buddha's mind, the technical terminology of Buddha's truth body, but a Buddha's mind, it means that aspect of the mind that is non-dualistically realizing emptiness. Okay? So that is conceded, that in sutra one does copy, imitate a Buddha's mind. There is a slight difference in that you don't think 
Now this is a Buddha's mind. Whereas in Tantra, with regard to the body, hand, mind, activities, you're thinking these are the body, mind, and activities of a Buddha. Small difference. So, they are, Tsongkhul was at least his, is it his, in only the writings of his followers or him? I forget. Uh, they are willing to say, just to repeat, that there is, in the Sutra systems, there is meditation that accords an aspect with the truth body or mind of a Buddha. In that, one enters meditative records on it. So, what is it, what is it, does it, when he says that the different, the central, the word carefully chosen, central distinguishing feature, not a distinguishing feature, but the <coughs> central distinguishing feature. You couldn't say the distinguishing feature between Sutra and Tantra is deity yoga, because there are many. But the central distinguishing feature between Sutra and Tantra is the presence of deity yoga. Does that mean that there is deity, that deity yoga is present in every Tantra? Now it doesn't. There's a lot of controversy about this, and it's where his distinction is the most vulnerable to, to attack. Because there are many action tantras in particular that don't involve meditating on yourself as a deity. In fact, most of them don't. And in fact, when you get into reading them and so forth, yes, they don't. <laughs> you're inviting a deity in front, and you're making offerings, and you're, you're um, influencing, shall we say, the deity to um, bestow certain boons upon you. Increase your intelligence, increase your lifespan, increase, increase your opportunities for enlightenment, etc., etc. And more petty things uh, also, but that are, have a broader mo motivation, broader altruistic motivation. So, how does he squeeze out of this? He says, even if the majority of action tantras don't involve theta yoga, he says the, that the main trainees for whom action tantras were taught, now this is double talk, the main trainees for whom action tantras were taught uh, are, are persons who needed deity yoga. I mean, I'll play along with anybody's system to a certain degree. <laughs> and, uh, but then he, so then he's got to come up with some action tantras, some tantras that people agree are action tantras that, that have deity yoga. And what he can come up with really based on Buddha Goya's commentary is the concentration continuation tantra. Now, unfortunately, when the concentration continuation tantra, because it's a continuation of another tantra, when it refers to <laughs> meditating on yourself as a deity, it's so condensed that you couldn't possibly understand that without looking at that other tantra, and that other tantra doesn't exist anymore. It was never translated into Tibetan. But there are citations of the sections on deity yoga uh, in, of course, in Buddha Guya's. It could look like a plot, but I don't think it is. <laughs> I don't think that's my, as cynical as I am, I don't think so. What was I going to get up to write down? It's that kind of day. <laughs> Maybe I should remain seated. We were talking about 
Yes. Oh, yes. The line in the concentration continuation tantra, why I'm telling you this is what I want to talk about is the process of meditation, which I think is very profound and very interesting. Okay? <coughs> but I don't want to do all of this and say, after we get done with it at the end of next week, shall we say, or the week after, and then say, oh yes, but this only appears in one very small action tantra, and you sort of, you know, you, you get this big thing in your mouth, and then you think, oh my God, that was really tiny, all right? I want to tell you, it's tiny first, okay? And then give you something really big. <laughs> is that, because I think the system meditation is really interesting, and deserves a lot of attention. So it's, I don't want to burst the balloon afterwards, I want to burst it first, and then blow it up. Ever seen anybody do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, literally, the, the uh, Tibetan says, flow to sound, tata, sim. Flow to sound, mind, and base. Tata, simta, shila, sure. And so for the Tibetanists, I'll write it out. Chatham, Simtham, Shi, La, Sho. Ooh, I forget how you pronounce it. Shana Sho Gasho. What? Shana Sho Gi. What? You're speaking too quickly, my man. Either that. It, it may have a cough prefix, but it probably doesn't. Um, now, the order is in fact even backwards. But that's all right. For the sake of euphony, things are not always laid out in order. Basis refers to meditating on yourself as a deity and meditating on deities in front. Why are they called bases? Because they are bases of the letters of the mantra. Now, the concentration continuation tantra, uh, I don't think it's entirely subtle. As I remember, there are two etymologies <coughs> of the name. Uh, but as I remember, it's a continuation of the Vajra Vidarana Tantra. In the Vajra Vidarana, this process is laid out in detail. And it's all cited in Songova's text. So if you wanted to challenge that it's really that the concentration continuation doesn't have deity yoga, you've got to challenge that text. And this, this, it's absolutely clear that he didn't make up that tantra, because we have Buddha Guya's commentary and so forth. If Buddha Guya, for some reason, made it up, who knows? But uh, I think that's highly doubtful also. OK? Then when Varabodhi <coughs> presents the Susidhi tantra, uh, in his uh, practice text, uh, he presents that with Didi also. Okay. So that's bursting the balloon of, of the presentation that the distinguishing feature of the four tantras is Didi Yoga. Bursting it in the sense that we have understood that very few action tantras, extremely few, have deity yoga. Yes? First of all, when we say that the action tantras don't have deity yoga, are we talking only about this type in which you meditate on yourself as the deity? Yes. Which is the distinguishing feature? Yes. And also, I didn't understand some of us how he out of this problem by saying that the main treatings for whom action tantras were taught are the persons who needed deity yoga. I didn't understand that. Well, <sighs> It's sort of like he decided that meditating on yourself as a deity 
is it's really important throughout all of Tantra, you know, throughout most of Tantra. And then how could he figure out a way to claim that it's important in action Tantra? Well, then why not claim that these few action Tantras that have it were taught to the real action Tantra trainees? The others are action, trainee, action Tantra trainees trainees, but not the real ones. I mean, it's a, it's, what do you call it? A fudge. Yes? Could we say uh, action tantra may be a preliminary to the other tantras, or a transition from sutra to tantra? Is that kind of argument made, or not? When you're doing a uh, black and white, what is the distinguishing right. feature between the two, then you can't say that. Uh, but uh, it's another way of looking at it. Yeah. Uh, that it's like looking at low vehicle and great vehicle and systems of tenants. When you're going to make low vehicle, great vehicle, you can't see transitions. Where do you draw the line? Yeah, you have to draw the line on the basis of the philosophical view, the view of emptiness. And then you run into certain problems because you're doing such a black and white reading. And the, the history of it suggests, uh, suggests otherwise. There are transitional schools. Yes. If you're using deity yoga as the primary distinguishing feature separating Tantra from Sutra, but it's really not included within all of Tantra, what's actually distinguishing the rest of Tantra from Sutra. There needs to be an interesting project then to search out what does distinguish all of Tantra from all of Sutra. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we should read you know, all these other people and see what their views are instead of looking for some central distinguishing feature that then you have to fudge on. Maybe this combination of qualities that they come up with will work, yeah. Now there's, oh, there's one terminological problem, which is no problem at all, is that tantras are called sutras also, but that's, that's minor. All of Buddha's word is called sutra in one respect, <coughs> and uh, that's, a, that's no problem, because there are two meanings to the word sutra. We're talking about the smaller meaning, okay? No problem. Yeah, it's, um, and I, I think one has to face, uh, well, for the Tibetanists, let me give you the Tibetan fudge. Um, it's, the, it's just intended trainees of action tantra. Chagyu. Chi du chao eh? means who are the intended objects. Don't confuse this chawa with Kriya Tantra. Chi du chao is a word that means um, those for whom something is done. Chagyu is Kriya Tantra, Action Tantra. Chagyu ki chil chao tul jao. But then why wouldn't the Action Tantras, if they are for those people, talk about the yoga? That's why I don't understand. But why are they still included? I think the question then is, why are they still included within the Action Tantra class? Why are the ones that don't have deity yoga included within the Action Tantra class if, okay, they don't have deity yoga? Is this Please find out. some kind of preparation? Please find out. <laughs> you see, when you're taking a mass of material, from India, and you're categorizing. You're going to, you're going to, you know, lump 
and it's maybe not going to be work out to be entirely satisfactory. satisfactory. But keep pursuing it. Maybe you can find something within the tradition that'll say why. Uh, you know, it should be something like, uh, uh, we don't want to get too far off on this, but one of, the, one of the ways of dividing up the four tantras is to say action tantras involve a lot of <coughs> external ritual. Performance <coughs> tantras have a modicum of external ritual and internal yoga. Yoga emphasizes internal yoga, and highest yoga has the unexcelled internal yoga. Now the problem is, when you look at something like the action tantra called the concentration continuation and its process of deity yoga and the three meditative sterilizations of body, speech, and mind, there is profound internal yoga, internal yoga. And when you look at highest yoga tantra ceremonies, such as the Kala Chakra Tantra, all right, there is a tremendous amount of external ritual. Do, do all the other three tantras have, do all of them have deity yoga in them, or are there some performance tantras, yoga tantras, Asya yoga tantras that don't have deity yoga in them? My memory is that people really can only identify two performance tantras. <clears throat> the Vairochana Avisambodhi Tantra uh, and the uh, Vajrapani Initiation Tantra, those two. It's sort of like it said, if those two aren't performance tantras, then we won't have any. <laughs> it goes by a negative. <laughs> and then you cite, you know, he cites a couple, maybe one person who said that, who said the performance tantra, the Vairochana Visambodhi. OK. Now, who should, now you, oh, yeah. Uh, I've not checked. I've gone on the assumption that those two do, because there's no controversy. Uh, uh, because there's no controversy. There's no question about a yoga time. When we speak of these levels of tantra, um, as elucidated perhaps by Tsongkhapa, um, are we referring to classifications of texts that can be categorized as per these four levels, or do we refer to um, attitudes of practice that uh, may be placed at any of these four levels, regardless of the text itself being referred to? Is that clear? Well, sort of. Is my question not too clear? Um, Certainly, it's text being classified into these four. And you have the text because there are beings who practice in these ways. And um, <coughs> merely because somebody does a highest yoga tantra ritual does not mean that that person is performing highest yoga tantra meditation. And you have to say that usually, <laughs> <laughs> They're not doing even tantric meditation or sutra meditation. <laughs> that none of the base qualifications, basic qualifications, are being met. All right. Hmm. So here we're dividing classes of literature, actually. Uh, but yeah, it's literature, and how do you divide them? Uh, it's supposedly based on the practices that are contained within them. Supposedly. It doesn't, I'm, well, we'll have to see later how, how I think it doesn't work out. How Tsongkhapa says it doesn't work out, and yet chooses one. For instance, okay, uh, he says the one he chooses is that action it's a great system. It's, it's promulgated in Highest Yoga Tantra. And it says a lot about Highest Yoga Tantra. A lot. You see, it's not that my cynicism 
undoes my interest in it. It just like confines it to where I think it should be. He says, it's how you use desire in the path. In Action Tantra, you take the desire that's involved in looking at a sexual partner. That desire, you know when you see somebody, there used to be a song across a crowded room, you know, you at some sort of party or a restaurant and you see somebody and your eyes meet and something happens, right? <laughs> and uh, you know, there's a desirous consciousness that is produced at that time. And then that desirous consciousness is used to realize emptiness. You see, w when you are desirous, the consciousness is strong, intense. And you use that consciousness to realize emptiness. And that's the level that you're at. You can use the level of desire that arises from looking. <clears throat> and you can imagine how hard that would be to do. <laughs> and then the second is smiling. Sometimes the first is translated as gazing. And the second is done as smiling. You know, in, the, in one way, the order of uh, sexual, mm, whatever, contact is looking. And then, then there's the smile that enhances it, you know? <laughs> uh, But of course, one thing that screws this up is that in some tantras, this with smiling first and looking second. But, you know, there would be the smile and then the longer gaze if you did it the other way around. And then in yoga tantra, there is, it's done in many ways, holding hands. You know what it's like when you first hold hands. You know, not when you're sick of it. Um, <laughs> holding hands and em embrace it. And you can see that would be even more intense. Closer, touching, in that the thrill of the touch, that mind of the thrill of the touch, realizes emptiness. Wow! Instead of causing you to <laughs> Think about well, how you're going to get the phone number, right? <laughs> and you start dreaming about, you know, how you're going to live together and all those things. You know, you use that mind to realize emptiness, reality. Is that because you, you realize the emptiness of your object of desire? Of? Or what? Uh, well, if you're, what you do is you, in the, you're practicing deity yoga. And uh, either physically or in imagination, actually it's said in these three tantras, it's all done in imagination. And you take this thrill of mind, and then you, you use it to realize the emptiness of what? Yourself, your partner, the, your mind, the partner's mind, your body, the partner's body, etc. So it's compared to a, that desire is, it, it sounds bad, but isn't, is compared to a worm. No, I'm sorry. The pleasure is compared to a, a worm that is born from wood in, you know how fruit flies appear in your garbage can, you don't know where they came from. So you, you might conclude they were produced from the garbage can. <laughs> I mean, I'm just wondering, like, anyway. <laughs> in the olden days, they didn't think that somehow eggs got in there. Because, you know, there's no way eggs could get in there. Don't tell me eggs could get in there. <laughs> so the wood is desire. Desire is the wood. And the wood gives birth to the worm, which is the pleasure. So it's the, the desire gives 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 birth to this pleasurable mind, right? 
without the desire, even you look, you're not going to have pleasure. Desire leads to pleasure. The pleasurable mind then realizes emptiness, which is like the worms eating the wood. So you see, eating the wood means eating the desire. In other words, Tantra is not aimed at the perpetuation of desire. It's using desire to end desire. To end desire. Yes? Um, in the sutra system, the first step, the first essential was to get into that state where there's an inherent, where you think that there's an inherently existing self, either yes. there's an anger or desire or some strong emotion. Is that, is that similar? We're using desire to really feel an inherently existing I, and then using that to. But in this case, the like the the start of that is similar. But in this case, the desire is leading to pleasure, and that pleasurable consciousness is realizing emptiness and making desire impossible. Now in the which is different, okay? You don't have process, any analytical process, then uh, setting in. I mean, realizing emptiness is analytical in a sense, but this could only be done by somebody who's quite familiar with the process of realizing emptiness. Thus, the integral nature of Sutra and Tantra, without having some, now, some acquaintance with emptiness, how could you possibly just suddenly do this uh, in the midst of a pleasurable and desirous situation? Then I guess I'm confused on what you mean by the pleasurable mind realizes emptiness. So there's a mind, for instance, when you're searching to find I and not finding it, that mind what is that mind? Well, it's a virtuous mind. It's a neutral mind. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I should be able to lay out all the qualities of it, but I can't. Uh, whereas here, you're taking this intensely concentrated, it's, it's concentrated by desire, by pleasure. But it's just all in, you, in its realizing it, it itself. So pleasure remains. It's not like the pleasure is destroyed. Exactly. It's almost insidious in that you're using the very thing, pleasure, that draws you into cyclic existence as, as the mind. The, the pleasure is the mind. It's the, what do you say, the, the bliss consciousness, the blissful consciousness. The pleasure, the pleasure experiencing consciousness. You use it to realize the thing that will get you out of this process. Yes. Well, it sounded as sounds as though you have two contradictory thing, two consciousnesses contradicting each other simultaneously. Well, desire gave birth to the pleasure, and then the pleasure is going to realize emptiness which is indeed completely contrary to generating desire. Completely contrary. But I think in the process of its movement, they're not simultaneous. Mm -hmm. And in highest yoga tantra, what's capable is what's called the joining of the two organs, which means, put more bluntly, it would be orgasm the mind orgasm. It's not that you learn how to sit with a sexual partner in, or you, you do a sexual partner, sexual embrace with a partner to the point where you don't care about it anymore, you know? <laughs> where you become neutral about it all, which actually is one way. You know, if you're distracted by sex or whatever it is, do so much of it or whatever, 
that that you just become bored by it all. I mean, that's not one way to, to accomplish this goal. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one way to improve your meditation. It can be. And in fact, one of the Indian authors looks on this process this way. His name is Tripitakamala. Tripitakamala. So he says, if you're distracted, you're trying to go into meditation on emptiness, and you're distracted by this and that, then do these practices. Otherwise, don't do them. <laughs> these are for lower sorts of trainees. Whereas in Tsongkhapa's system, the way he interprets it, these are for higher trainees who are capable of using this. And in fact, in the end, if you're going to achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, you're going to have to do it this way. So capable of using a mind, the most intense mind of pleasure, orgasm, that mind to realize emptiness. And you think, so how could you, you know, do that? So this is what highest Yoga Tantra says about the others. And Yoga Tantra does speak great, it has a lot about it on embrace, embraces. When you read the uh, Tattva Sangraha Tantra, which is the root yoga tantra, there's embraces all over the place. Uh, when performance and action, even though Pudin found a couple of little instances of uh, smiling and uh, gazing, uh, that there's no predominance. Or, and my point is that Tsongaba himself is honest enough in his presentation of when he actually gets to the presentation of Action Tantra, he never mentions this fourfold layout. He never mentions look, uh, looking, gazing. He never even brings it up. Why? Because it's not in his sources. His sources, the concentration continuation tantra with Buddha Goya's commentary. It's there's no one, there's not a single word. So he doesn't add it to make this thing work out right even if he himself uses this later on. You could say he lacks the, I wouldn't want to say honesty, but <laughs> lacks the whatever to say, but I myself never even found this. Uh, he does cite a couple stanzas from Action Tantra that Pudern had found, or somebody <coughs> before Pudern. Anyway, Pudern cites them. Yes. So each of those each of those four sets that you're talking about is like a different different level of yoga, like the looking and yes. using is action, and the smiling is performance. Yes. And so you could take this highest yoga tantra viewpoint on these others, and if a person were practicing these, or, or practicing any of them. Uh, uh, which may get to what you were saying, mix in one of these sexual practices. See what you're capable of doing. You with me? So now, the lack, at least in performance and action tantra, of practices involving looking, gazing, and smiling and the fact that they are reversed leads me to draw the conclusion that even this way of separating the four tantras doesn't work, which is Tsongkhapa's way of doing. And the, the other one is this, what I've already mentioned about having lesser and greater amounts of external uh, ritual. You know, I, to do that, you almost have to time the ceremonies. You know? <laughs> So that given, our discussion here gives you a skewed view of Action Tantra in that none of the external ritual uh, is presented in this book, the handout. A little of it, the bathing, is presented in this book. 
some Tibetan masters write off action tantra in the most glib terms, uh, say, uh, you know, that it's just bathing and you know a little bit of ritual, and and they're just not concerned with us with a study, a thoroughgoing study of action tantra. That they want to get onto their own topics, and I think it's one of the strengths of Tsongkhapa's presentation that he bothers to go into this in detail because it turns out to be a really interesting uh, set of meditations. Why did you use this in the text? Why didn't you just to choose a high seal the tantra to describe Dhyayoga or Yoga Tantra? Because um, this is so neat. It's, it's really, it's better than what I mean, the performance tantra section is tiny. In the Yoga Tantra section, he doesn't bother to discuss Deity Yoga. He uses it as an opportunity to discuss emptiness yoga. In Highest Yoga Tantra, well, I mean, so, so few people know about this, mm -hmm. and it has such good techniques in it. Mm -hmm. It was very attractive to me. And so, of course, some people say, oh, it's just Action Tantra, <laughs> as if as if it would somehow be easy. Mm. So that's the, the prologue. Now, I've forgotten some of this terminology myself, and as I'm reading, of course, I'm reading along with you, I'm bringing it back, back to life. Um, and one thing all of us have to keep straight are the various sets of terminology that overlap, sometimes in very odd ways, that, that aren't, uh, you know, that are counterintuitive when you uh, first see them. The overall structure is put in terms of three types of meditative stabilization of exalted body, speech, and mind. And as we go along, we'll make a map. And please make maps for yourself as you go along to try and figure out where we are. So there's a four-membered repetition, which might, which might th make you think that as you did, that the four members weren't one thing and the repetition another, right? Whereas actually, the main part of the four members is without any repetition <coughs> at all, repetition of mantra. <coughs> And so first, we have this last term, base, which by context is understood to be bases. Other base, which in Tibetan is shankishi, and self base, which is uh, dagishi. Other base, is the deity that you imagine in front. And that, in practice, is done first. Why? In the simple? It's the wholesome states of mind. That, these are two very good uh, non-traditional answers. Because it's simpler, because it's not meditating on yourself as a deity, because you're getting all these wholesome minds of you know, making offerings and so forth, deity in front. It's, it's, it's more difficult to do it after you've already, uh, you're concentrating on, you know, your own body's appearance in the day, you're trying to maintain that. Yes. You're, you're seeking to do a meditation of calm abiding, a fixed, stabilizing meditation on yourself as a deity. So if you did that first and then imagine the deity in front, it would distract you. So you do the deity in front, then you do yourself, and then 
and then you're set here, and the meditation can proceed along more easily. So what we're going to be talking about is the here is the second of the four members. Um, when is mantra repetition used? Is mantra repetition used at all when you're doing, when you're cultivating the self base? Preliminary to developing the uh, self base, uh, there is the mantra of Salawa Sawa Shud. Not that. I mean, repetition yeah. of mantra, the, you know, going on with a particular mantra. Is this for resting? Yes. Resting. But it's used it's for resting. Meditation. Establishing the body, the divine body. So the main meditation is on the divine, your own divine body. So, and you get tired some, you could sit there and, you know, you know. Uh, but as the Dalai Lama jokes, if you, the Tibetans you see usually, do the right that you say, I'm meditating on myself with a blue body, so on here, blah, 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 blah. You know, all description of yourself. And then immediately they, they do repetition of mantra. And the joke, of course, is if, then how can you rest? The only thing you can do to rest is to get up and leave the session, which is, of course, probably what people want to do. <laughs> Uh, okay. These four. Oh, yeah. So, included with the stabilization, meditative stabilization of exalted body. The repetition done after succeeding in visualizing these is included in meditative stabilization of exalted speech. Oh, I had forgotten that. Then, then why would sound be called? Sound then here just refers to the letters of the mantra. Okay. Okay. Imagining oneself as a deity. So here's in the middle of page 28, top third. Do you think we'll finish this assignment this semester? <laughs> The extensive Vidarana, and I think it's been spelled several different ways in this text, Vidarana, Vidarana. Uh, I'm going to have to look it up and find out which way it's right. I'm just embarrassed. Having first bathed, you see, ritual bathing. Has anybody read, happened to have read what, what's used for soap when you bathe? Dirt. Dirt. Why? Because it's abrasive. It's like lava, so it's abrasive. abrasive. It actually works. Yes. Yeah. A yogi sits on the Vajra cushion, having offered a main petition, you see the external, the other base, cultivates the six deities. Emptiness, or ultimate, sound, letter, form, seal, and sign are the six. So ultimate deity. Now, what do you have to say about this mantra that's used at the beginning of Dulcin Trapagansen's depiction of the deity, of deity yoga? Did anyone notice that the other commentators say, this is what's done, for instance, in the higher tantras? I don't know about yoga tantra, but certainly in highest yoga tantra. Not in action tantra, but he's put it into action tantra. And Hopkins, I think, is a little weak to have himself not made note. I should have made note that um, adding this here is really adding something from another system. Just as my own suchness is ultimately free from all the elaborations of inherent existence, so is the deity suchness also. So 
the ultimate deity is a recognition, in a sense, a positive recognition that the deity suchness and my suchness are exactly the same. Now, in technical terminology, this is not just called positive. It's called an affirming negation. It's a negation that has something positive in it. What's the negation? The emptiness of inherent existence. What's positive is the same. Yes. I have seen uh, uh, Tenjur uh, sadhanas related to Vajrapani and Buddha Dhammaru um, that describe themselves as being at the action tantra level that do invoke this mantra. And I'll try to find you. That's a sadhana, just as Dulzin Tarpagansen is doing a sadhana. This is what we need is a. Uh, basic text. Sadhana is like Varabodhi's uh, sadhana or practice text for the Susidhi. But it's uh, worthy of note. Your point is most worthy of note. Therefore, in terms of non-conceptual perception of the final mode of existence of phenomena, Suchness of myself and of the deity are undifferentiable like a mixture of water and milk. As I said before, last time, water and milk is two different things. Uh, rather than water and water, or milk and milk. Uh, but the, no one identifies like the suchness of the deity is like milk and is really worth something. And your suchness is like water and <laughs> compared to that milk. <laughs> no one does this. It's just that water and milk, when you mix them together, you can't say, here's the milk and here's the water. The two things that really mix like that. And there are some things which you could pour together that don't, like when you're making a cake and so forth. Right? You've got to beat them up. Put in an egg, even into very loose flour. It doesn't immediately spread out and mix in. So Kidru, on the next page, the indented material, he said, right in the middle of it, that twofold suchness. Why is emptiness called suchness? Because it remains such whether it's realized or not. That's what's said in the Lankavatara Sutra. It's called suchness deity. That twofold suchness is the suchness deity from among the six deities. So this would be something like God, wouldn't it? Is the equivalent of meditating equivalent, you see, he says, from his point of view, is the equivalent of meditating on the mantra in another, in other systems. In higher tantra, Gyude Koma. Koma here, I would think, would have to be yoga and highest yoga. Then pride, next page, top of the next page. Some translators, Alex Burson, for instance, don't want to use the word pride because that's an affliction. And so they say dignity. You're to cultivate the <laughs> dignity. It's very funny to me. Pride's funny too, but <laughs> he's like struggle. I mean, he's a good friend. It's like struggling to avoid the word pride. But that's the word. You know, it's among the, uh, the root afflictions, pride. And so then you have to wonder why the term pride is being used. Is it because it is an affliction, an afflictive emotion? <laughs> to 
to think. <laughs> ah, yeah. Ah. So, but no one says, really. I haven't seen any description of why the term pride is used. Except you're willing. So I think it indicates that you have to be willing You're creating the pride of the sameness of yourself in the deity. <clears throat> so much you read today about Jung's cautions. How could this pride serve as a counteragent to Dangerous inflation. Emptiness. Hmm? Emptiness. Because, right, it's built on realization of emptiness, which is the unfindability of yourself and the deity. And it's just a, dip, a sameness of nature or a deity that's designated in dependence upon a sameness of nature. But then, I guess I don't really understand why that should make you proud. If they're both equally empty, then they're the same. Why should that inspire pride? If they're well, you see, it's not pride. It's not right. an afflictive emotion. It's merely a conception of I, but of a glorious I not the common being that's designated in dependence upon, you know, this sort of cruddy flesh, blood, and bone. When you finally appear entirely, you have what you're imitating is a consciousness directly realizing emptiness, same time appearing as a deity. So you have pure mind and body. So it's a being that is designated in dependence upon pure mind and body, which makes that deity, that being, pure which makes that being a deity, that's all. Rather than the limited Jeffrey Hopkins, who's got this and that disease, and, and this is aching, and that's aching, and my throat's getting a little parched, and why didn't I bring my cup for water today, and so forth. One of the root infractions in Highest Yoga Tantra, at least in Gelu, is to look down on, deride your own mind and body. Oh, I've got this ache and pain, or oh, I'm too fat, or, you know? All these things that we're constantly <coughs> thinking. I ought to build myself, my, whatever it is. My hair ought to be this way or that way. It's all infraction. Why? because you're supposed to appear to yourself in this ideal form. And if you're paying attention to this junk, then uh, you're conceiving yourself to be ordinary. Yes. So it's not the same? I'm always passing. Yes. Oh, wait. Yes, please. No, please, go ahead. No, no, you first. <laughs> well, are you using this notion of pride in the same way you're using desire, which leads to pleasure, to the really... No. Okay. No. This is a non-afflictive pride. And this is an afflicted desire. This is afflictive. And so pride, you, you, you wouldn't, it's not like I'm feeling proud. It's not. It's just that you do have a sense of I that's designated in dependence upon pure mind and body. And because that mind and body is exalted, um, You are exalted, and you can see why Alex wants to say, because it's not afflictive, create the dignity of yourself, you know, a dignified concept of yourself as being pure, whatever he says. Divine dignity. But it, I, I think that's brings up other matters, plus I'm very conservative and think if the book says pride, you ought to say pride and struggle with it. 
So my guess is that the word pride is used because when you look into emptiness, sometimes, especially if it's not understood exactly right, you know, you feel that there's some sort of contradiction with appearing. Never mind appearing as a glorious being who's going to do all these marvelous things for so many people. So it's using a term that's usually for an affliction in a non-afflictive way. Mm. I was going to say that it's not the same as the afflictive pride, but on the other hand, is it completely different? Utterly yes. different from the afflictive pride? I say utterly. Really, that there's no, it may be based in it, oh. but because you've seen emptiness, it's somehow purified in that sense? <laughs> Afflictive pride is totally built on the misconception of inherent existence. This kind of pride is built on the wisdom realizing emptiness. And yet the qualities seem to be the same, otherwise the same word wouldn't be used. No, the quality of pride is uh, a puffing up based on your uh, qualities, and this is not a, uh, an arrogance. Um, but of course the word is used. And they're still using the word that's like arrogance. I, I'm not pretending I'm giving excellent answers. Yeah, okay. yeah actually, I don't understand exactly how it builds, but he told us that Lama also says that it's actually so opposite to it that it actually uh, mm. reminds your pride. I mean, yes. Our feeling of this. Yes, pride. that's a good point which doesn't entirely undo his okay. point. Yeah. Yes. Um, aren't you just creating agency within the appearance vector um, with pride? I mean, you have to have agency in order for there to be a transformation. And so if you want to have pure agency, something that's not afflicted, you can call it pride, but you're also placing it within the appearance factor while you're understanding that there's also an ascertainment factor that is going to um, keep the agency from being afflicted. Um, what does agency here mean? Well, the self that you're talking about does not um, negate the, the practitioner in a way. Um, the, the part of the process that um, there's something going on, so if there's something going on, there's an agent. And that seems to be the best way to posit an agent without positing the self. It says develop the pride, which would be a mental factor uh, or something in mental attitude uh, of, of being a deity. So I don't know is actually even the pride is the agent. It's you, the meditator. But of course, you, the meditator, are the one who's going to appear as the deity. Well, it's a good point to end the discussion. <laughs> uh, so, for next time, please read the same material again. Read, read, read. <laughs>